So what, uh, but first, I, I want to thank everyone for being here. And I'm going to try to keep uh, the remarks super short so we can just start getting into the things. Uh, I think everyone should have a card uh, at their chair. So if you have questions, uh, please write them down. And then uh, I think we're going to have people gathering them. Uh, I think one of the most useful things with having everyone here is making sure that we're, we're using the time to have as much as a dialogue as we can. Uh, as Dr. Holdren uh, talked about, this is one uh, area of that I think everyone here, and I've uh, went coming into the White House, has, has been just amazingly impressed with how much people not only care about this, but are taking active action and, uh, and doing things. If you haven't, I highly encourage you to go to climate.data.gov and see how much great data is out there. Uh, if, uh, especially uh, speaking as myself, as a, when I was a grad student, uh, I actually, my whole research career started on top of that open data, uh, being able to get that data, work on it, and actually come up with research. So uh, please share the word out there about that stuff, because uh, it, it is an amazing amount of effort that goes into making sure that it's out there. Uh, to get things going, what uh, we're going to do is going to ask each of our uh, panelists to give about four minutes I'm going to hold you to, not about, we're going to call it four minutes because we, we really want to get to the conversation. Uh, and to kick things off, uh, I think we're going to have Linda go first and to just kind of give you an overview. Uh, where is, oh, Linda is right there. Uh, so uh, uh, Linda is the director of the climate, uh, of the Center for Climate Change and Health at the Public Health Institute, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Uh, and she's previously served as a deputy director for chronic disease prevention and health promotion in the California Department of Public Health. Uh, she's also been the founding chair of the Climate Action, Climate, California Climate Action Team, uh, a public health work group, and uh, the California Strategic Growth Council Health, and all the policies task force around that area. She's also formerly the health officer and public health director for the city of Berkeley and the Chief Medical Officer for uh, Medi-Cal Managed Care. And she's received her uh, medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and an MPH from Epidemiology from UCSF. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you to the White House and OSDP for organizing this really important conversation. I'm honored to be a part of it, and I'm really excited about the other announcements that the White House made this morning about climate change and health. Uh, climate change is the defining health challenge of this century. It is impacting us now here in the U.S. and it's impacting people around the world. As Dr. Holdren alluded to, the health impacts of climate change are diverse and will only increase, ranging from heat illness, injuries from extreme weather <coughs> events, increases in food and waterborne disease, changes in vector-borne disease, mental health problems, and much more. In California, as the drought unfolds, we see hundreds of families without tap water to drink or bathe, an epidemic of dust-borne valley fever, tens of thousands out of work as fields are fallowed, and food banks struggling to keep up with demand as food insecurity rises. So climate change really threatens the air, water, food, shelter, and security on which human life depends. It is an existential threat not just for polar bears, but also for us. The health impacts of climate change occur in the context of the physical, social, and economic environments in which we live and work. These environments are the key determinants of individual and community health outcomes. We know that some neighborhoods have more parks, better schools and groceries, less crime, more transportation options than others. It's inequalities in the distribution of these opportunities for better health that create unacceptable differences in health status and life expectancy by race, class, and place across the nation. And together, these inequalities in health status and living environments create inequalities in climate vulnerability. People with chronic illness are more affected by rising ozone levels. Those who live in tree-poor urban heat islands or who work outdoors in construction and agriculture are at higher risk of heat illness. People living in poverty are less able to cope with rising food prices or to rebuild their lives after a Katrina or a Sandy. The poor, the sick, the elderly, and people of color 
are all disproportionately harmed by the impacts of climate change. But climate change may also present one of our greatest health opportunities. The systems transformations that are needed to kick the fossil fuel habit, avert catastrophic climate change, and increase community resilience to the impacts of climate change can also yield huge co-benefits for health. Burning dirty fossil fuels to produce electricity results in greenhouse gas emissions and in thousands of cardiovascular and respiratory deaths from each year from air pollution. If we shift to safe and clean energy, we can reduce climate change and reduce the health effects of air pollution. Our industrialized agriculture system generates methane, but also contributes to antibiotic resistance, nitrate contaminated water wells, and store shelves that are filled with cheap, calorie-dense products. If we shift to more sustainable diets and food systems, we can protect our ever more precious drinking water from contamination and reduce diet-related cardiovascular disease and obesity. Our transportation system supports unhealthy, sedentary lifestyles. A modest increase in walking, biking, and, trans uh, tr and, and public transit could yield huge reductions in heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and depression, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Greening our communities to reduce urban heat could also clean the air, provide nicer places to play, better recharge our water aquifers, and support greater social cohesion and emotional well-being. So I think the question for today is, how can data and technology innovation empower communities in partnership with our public health system and the private sector to advance systems change and optimize climate solutions for health, justice, and sustainability? Can we strengthen our existing public health programs, such as the Environmental Health Tracking Program, to support syndromic surveillance for climate-related illness, to integrate health and demographic data, downscaled climate projections, and social, economic, and environmental vulnerability measures to understand how to target interventions for climate resilience, or to provide timely and targeted alerts to those most sensitive to ozone heat and wildfire? How can we more routinely assess the health and equity consequences of climate change solutions? How can we use data to motivate behavior change through better understanding of how daily choices impact both climate and health? Can we integrate hard data with the essential community knowledge about vulnerabilities, assets, and resources to support climate change preparedness and resilience? And how can we use data to mobilize and empower communities to demand the policy and systems changes that will make the healthy, climate-friendly choices the easy choices? I invite you to learn more about opportunities to address climate health and equity in the report that we at the Center for Climate Change and Health released today, and I turn to my colleagues to learn about the possibilities of data innovation for health justice and sustainability. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. So, uh, next, Ethan, uh, so tell us a little bit more about your research, uh, and, and for those that don't know, Ethan is a researcher at the the Research and Software Engineering Group at Microsoft Research. And Ethan works on programming and modeling cyber physical systems, which include autonomous and semi-autonomous uh, robotic platforms. And he leads uh, Microsoft's research expedition on safe cyber physical systems. Uh, and it aims to develop safe and secure software platforms for autonomous systems. And Ethan received his PhD in computer science from Vanderbilt and his uh, bachelor's uh, from University of Pittsburgh, and he's, uh, uh, he joined Microsoft Research in 2007. So I'd love to hear more about how you're thinking about it. Right, so I think um, Linda enumerated some very serious challenges, but the common thread in them is, um, can we get more data to make science-based decisions? Um, and can we, can we handle that influx of data that we're getting if, if we can get it? Um, so I think uh, from Microsoft Research point of view, one thing that we've been engaged with pretty early in the climate data initiative is trying to answer that question for the climate data sets. Can we figure out how to, how to analyze them, how to crunch them effectively? Um, and that's been going on for, for a few years now. Um, the reason why I'm sitting here is because um, we've been thinking about sort of the next step of data sets that are very difficult to obtain. Um, you know, we don't already have weather satellites, we don't already have weather stations gathering them. But um, so, so in, in particular, we're thinking about data sets related to, uh, to vector-borne diseases and infectious diseases. 
we know um, climate change is affecting the distribution of uh, disease vectors and pathogens, but the ways that you go out into the environment to figure that out is um, complicated, it's slow and expensive, right? You send a field biologist who goes, um, in fact, I just came back from a trip where, where we did this, um, and 18 hours a day, I hiked through jungles um, catching mosquitoes, so I, so, and, and I didn't catch that many. Um, so, so what I know is uh, um, getting this data today is, is, is uh, slow and time consuming. From our point of view, what we asked is, can autonomous systems make that easier? So instead of having people have to trek through jungles and through complex urban environments, what if you can just get this data quickly, regularly, so that what you see are the movement of vectors and diseases in space and time um, constantly. You don't have to guess about it. Um, that's why I come from a group that works, at, that looks at building autonomous systems that are very safe and very robust. Because to really execute a scenario like that, where machines can go into the environment, collect something that's not easy to collect and bring it back to you, you have to make sure that they're doing that effectively, safely, robustly, both in terms of um, uh, uh, society, so that society is happy with it, but also in terms of cost. If it fails all the time, it just isn't valuable. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the place I fit within Microsoft Research. Those are the problems that we're thinking about. Um, can we get new data sets, and when we get them, how do we crunch them in new ways? Thank you. Awesome. So as, as we race through this, uh, two things real quick. One is you can ask questions on the note cards, and then if you're online, you can participate by, with hashtag act on climate. So uh, please join us for that portion of the conversation. Uh, Allison, uh, as I flip over, uh, Ali, uh, she, you're a program manager at Google Earth Outreach Team, and she uh, leads the Google efforts to support nonprofits, scientists, other public benefit groups using Google tools, technologies for specifically infer, uh, inf infectious disease mapping and risk assessment. Uh, she has a degree in economics from Washington University in St. Louis. And you've been at Google for a resounding four years, <laughs> which is no small feat for people <laughs> watching everyone there. Uh, it's awesome to see the, the work that, that, that you guys have been doing, uh, especially managing the nonprofit's uh, Geo Grants program and other initiatives. Mm -hmm. So love to hear how you're, you're thinking about it. I think you're going to show us some, yes, some cool stuff. Yes, thank you, DJ. And thank you all for coming. Again, and Linda and Ethan have set the stage very nicely. Uh, I'm here to talk about how Google is empowering scientists and decision makers to tackle problems at a global scale. Through our Google Earth Engine remote sensing data analysis platform, we are storing and managing massive amounts of global scale data. This is NOAA and NASA and data from other agencies as well. And we're working with leading scientists to distill that data into information and knowledge that can drive better decision making. One area in which we believe we can be transformative is measuring and monitoring the impacts of the changing climate on human health. Google Earth Engine was initially developed to map global deforestation, but now we are working with scientists and other partners to not only save trees, but to also save lives. With that in mind, we are committing to providing 10 million hours of high performance computing, in addition to our previous commitments, and hosting of global scale geospatial data. This will assist scientists in predicting disease risk, in visualizing fire and oil and gas flares, <laughs> and measuring methane emissions. Google will also dedicate time to uh, technically assist these scientists as well. But we do encourage all scientists to sign up for this free tool. So I will give just a quick snapshot into these three ongoing projects that we have started. First, we are technically assisting scientists around the world in their creation and hosting of disease early warning capabilities with dynamically updating near real-time disease risk maps. Our leading example is of uh, University of California, San Francisco. The global health group there 
has been using Google Earth Engine's continually updating daily data feeds of environmental and weather data and combining these with malaria case data that are reported on the ground. Together, they can see where uh, mosquitoes are most likely to hatch and where malaria is at highest risk to be transmitted. The goal of this project, though, is to bring the science out of the laboratories and into operational use by building applications that make it easily understandable by program managers and ministries of health, the people on the ground that need to make real-time decisions about allocation of limited resources for interventions. Inside the United States, this platform uh, could also be a tool for monitoring diseases like dengue fever and West Nile virus. Zooming out a bit, Randy Sargent, a visiting scientist at Google uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, has been creating these interactive and zoomable uh, time series animations of daily global fires and oil and gas flaring. This right here is a year of fires at night measured by the NASA and NOAA VIRS satellite instrument. Um, it's fires visible at the global scale and you can see that most of them are seasonal and set by man to clear land for agricultural use. In the US, you can see that the largest areas of fires are from flaring methane in areas of hydraulic fracturing for extraction of gas and oil, which of course ties back to greenhouse gas emissions uh, from both methane and CO2. Finally, in collaboration with nonprofit Environmental Defense Fund, we have begun pilot studies which leverage the mobility and coverage of Google's Street View cars uh, to measure methane emissions and map natural gas leaks in select U.S. cities through 2015. We are also exploring the possibility of measuring other air pollutants in the coming year as well. You can see on EDF's maps that are online, uh, you can see where leaks have occurred. This is a, a map of Boston. So I encourage you to take a look. And again, these are just a few of the projects that we have going on right now, but I am very excited to continue the discussion, and thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Ernesto is right over here. Ernesto is, uh, is at Quantified Self Labs, uh, where he's the program director and also the co-curator of the American and European Conference and uh, Event Programs. As lead editor for Quantified Self, he uh, communicates about how to think about self-tracking, personal data, the impact it has on society, culture, and he's also a PhD candidate in public health at uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, which I'm personally biased to as an <laughs> alma mater, and uh, where he's studying how people integrate health technology into their daily lives. So please tell us a bit more. Yeah, thanks, DJ. Um, so I'll start off by talking a little bit about Quantified Self, what we do, and then hopefully branch a little bit into why I'm sitting up here. So Quantified Self Labs is a small organization based in Berkeley, and we support what we call the Worldwide Quantified Self Movement. Has anyone here ever been to a Quantified Self meetup? Randy, <laughs> great, <laughs> awesome. So we actually, um, starting in 2008, we started having meetings around how people were dealing with computing because it was getting a lot closer to the body. Obviously now that makes sense because we have Fitbits and we have smartphones that measure our geolocation, the steps we take. I mean, my iPhone, my iPhone counted, I think, the five or six flights of stairs I had to walk up here, which is great. Um, but since then, we are now branched out into about 115 meetups uh, in over 30 countries around the world. We put on two conferences a year, one in the US and one in Amsterdam. And recently, we, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we're branching out to start to bring together actors and advisors, policymakers, researchers, and people in government to talk about the role of personal data and personal data access for both personal and public health. When people think about quantified self, they usually think about those nerds 
that track obsessively about everything about their lives, which card-carrying member, I totally am a nerd, I track obsessively, I have almost 15 million Fitbit steps, which I'm very proud of, um, but there's a whole other piece. There's, a, there's millions of people, not only in the United States, but around the world, tracking things that matter to them. And that's what we do at Quantified Self Labs, is we try and help propagate the stories that people tell about their own data and its importance in their lives. We have found time and time again that people have very, very interesting questions that they want to answer about themselves using, using data they can collect either written, written by hand on pieces of paper, in a spreadsheet, online, or using really sophisticated tools that they buy off the shelf you know, at a Best Buy or on Amazon, or in some cases, tools that they design themselves. It's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And the reason we're here and why I'm really happy to be here is because we are starting to see and understand that the questions that people ask themselves about their lives, especially around their health, don't have to be just about how many steps they get or how much they weigh in the morning or what they're eating. It can be about their homes and their neighborhoods and their communities. And there's a lot of really interesting things going on in this space, both from citizen science perspectives, people making DIY sensors, things that are going up on Kickstarter and Indiegogo to measure particulate matter and you know, put these little you know, DIY sensors up online so people can measure airflow around communities and around the nation. And we're even seeing commercial actors get into this, where if you buy, I think there's a, there's a French company called Y-Things that makes a scale now that will measure the CO2 levels in your bedroom. They actually say you should put this in your bedroom because that's what matters. Um, and now a bunch of companies are making things that go inside your home that can measure volatile organic compounds and other things. And we see this really expanding. And I think what's going to happen is people are going to start to ask those questions that they ask themselves about their communities. They're going to say, what does the impact of my environment, where I go to school, where I work, how I get there, how does that actually impact all of the other data that I'm collecting? And we're really excited to hopefully bring some of the expertise that's in Quantified Self, both the engaged individuals, the companies, the researchers around the country, to work together with people at the Environmental Protection Agency and other entities to take those open data sets, which are so fantastic. Like, I will echo DJ, like, go to climate.data.gov. There's such amazing stuff there. And we're hoping to really incite people. So today, you know, as part of the announcement, you know, we announced that we're going to start some challenges starting formally at our Quantified Self Public Health Symposium in May and ending at our conference in June, where we're gonna challenge people in communities, in companies, at research institutions to take some of that data, take their own, uh, their own abilities, their own tools, their own data, layer that together so that we can really understand the role of personal data for not only personal health, but also public health and environmental health. So excited to be here, hope, to, hope I can answer some good questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, Esty uh, is at uh, Esri, and she's going to show us some of the work uh, that she's doing. Uh, and she's, uh, at the, she's a chief medical officer there, and her work uh, focuses on the improvement of health through uh, strategic use of geographic information systems. And her prior roles include deputy director of the Center uh, for Health Statistics and Informatics uh, with the California Department of Public Health an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the, the University of California at, San, at Davis, and where she received her medical degree and her master's degree in public health and informatics. So I'd love to see what uh, you've been working on. Thank you, DJ. Good afternoon. It's certainly an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Now, I know that you know that our country and our world are facing very serious challenges. It's been said that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So we need to really stop and think about that for a minute. I strongly believe that our health is our most valuable resource, and we must relentlessly protect it. But it's complicated. Data that shows the integration between health and climate change come from many different sources. They vary temporally, geographically, and in scale. So we need to look at tools that integrate many types of data from Landsat and environmentally sensed data to healthcare and public health resources as well as demographic information 
and so much more. Taking a geographic approach is powerful. Geography as a science not only provides us with the content and the context of our world, it provides a framework for understanding. We can bring together all of our data assets so we can analyze them, visualize them, and detect patterns. And then we can create informed action. I know you're all aware that the impacts of climate change on human health cover a wide spectrum of pathways. Some of them are direct, like severe weather and heat stress causing injuries, heat exhaustion, cardiovascular failure, or death. Some are indirect, like drought, which can lead to food insecurity and put you at risk for malnutrition or mental stress. Complex problems call for coordinated and collaborative approaches. Now in this application, we can predict which cities will have similar indices to other cities. So for example, in 2040, St. Louis may have a similar profile to Las Vegas. So St. Louis leadership might start investing in uh, capital improvements that will assist their population in adaptation, like maybe ensuring that all new housing structures have air conditioning. And in this animation, we can focus in on St. Louis and understand what's going on with the population when we look at the number of heat days over 90 degrees or 100 degrees in a year. Planners and responders can use the Social Vulnerability Index to understand where are the most susceptible populations and then target their interventions strategically. And when you add things like tabular data and graphic data, uh, and other sorts of infographics that really impact your decision making, it goes a long way toward a solution. Now so far I've only talked about the impact of climate change on human health, but I would like to suggest that if we want to be successful in addressing this challenge, we need to constantly push ourselves to think more broadly about our analytic approaches. One Health is an initiative that promotes an integrative understanding of health for people animals, and the environment. I think that the understanding these intersections is critical to our approach to uh, climate change and human health. And the One Health framework is appropriate for many different kinds of diseases, from tuberculosis and Ebola to influenza and hantavirus. So this next demonstration shows my point. We can look at the hispid cotton rat and its climate-induced rain shift so green indicates the area of expansion for this vector over the next, say, 25 years or the next 55 years. Since this rat is a vector for hantavirus, new populations may be exposed to this disease. And so then when we think about how infectious diseases spread, we have to think about our mobile lifestyle. This application looks at airports and their connecting flights. I've chosen two airports that are in that green area for the hispid cotton rat. So you can see that there is significant potential for disease spread. A One Health approach could enable a deeper understanding and broader action. And speaking of action, ESRI continues its commitment to making a difference. This year we'll assist in data availability through uh, our work with data.gov to enable a tool so that people can visualize spatial data immediately. We'll facilitate collaboration and innovation through whiteboarding sessions with our local government stakeholders, an app challenge, and an online collaboration platform that shows best practices, model applications, and shared data resources. It's essential that we all work together to address this important problem and at ESRI, we actually are very appreciative of the opportunity to innovate with you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right, so just a quick reminder, if you've got cards, uh, please write down your questions. Hand them to the people waving their hands over there. Uh, you can also uh, engage with us by with the hashtag on Twitter, uh, ActOnClimate. Uh, if you really want to game the system, you can do both. Uh, so <laughs> you can try every technique that you can. So. Uh, the, the thing that, one of the things that, as a data scientist, playing with some of the data, some of the tools that, you, that, that you've put out there, the, the 
reading the papers. One of the things that I take away is both how amazing the opportunity to do science with this is, also how terrifying some of the results are simultaneously. And so the question I, I want to kick things off with, and I just want to, let's, let's try to go with really brief question, uh, brief answers as we can because we want to cover as much territory as, as we could possibly get to, is if, if you had to, if you had a captive audience, which we luckily have here, and you want them to take away one thing which you wake up every morning thinking about and wish the rest of the world got, what would that one thing be? We have the know-how to change systems for health and climate change, and we need to mobilize and activate so that we implement solutions to preserve a healthy life and a healthy planet for our kids. And, and say a little bit more, like, when you say we have the know-how, say it's, give us a couple more uh, sentences about, like, what does that know-how look like for you as we're, as we're taking, turning this into action? We have the capacity to shift our energy system to clean, renewable energy. Um, and it's actually pretty cost effective now. Um, we just need to do it. Uh, we have the, uh, the scientific and technical knowledge for what to change in the way that we produce our food so that we reduce our reliance on uh, fossil fuel based mm -hmm. agriculture and also protect our drinking water and protect our soil and protect our health. We just need to do it. We know how we can uh, build more heat resilient cities with planting trees and greening our cities with more parks and changing our energy uh, use and um, changing some of our land use patterns. And those are complicated things to change, but if we put our mind to it, we, you know, we have American know-how we're a can-do uh, society. We just need to take the knowledge that we have and apply it to these really complex, wicked problems that we're facing in terms of both climate change, health inequities, and our chronic illness um, epidemics. But we have solutions that are really win-win wins. They're wins economically. They're wins for our health. They're wins for the planet's sustainability. They're wins for animals. And um, I think our problem is a, a lack of imagination of, you know, of how to, how to move forward, how to address these complex problems. So I think that's my, my message I wake up with every morning <laughs> is let's get to work. Ernesto. Um, yeah, everything, I mean, when, I, when I wake up in the morning, I, I'm always thinking about how people are able to ask themselves the questions they care about and how we as an organization and the, the partners we work with, how can we enable those questions to be answerable? And so uh, what I would say is that um, you have to start by giving people credit. And I think that's unfortunately something that doesn't happen, especially when it comes to talking about data. Data becomes this very big nebulous idea and people think that you have to know something like Python or R or be really, really good in Excel, if that's your cup of tea, um, <laughs> to understand data and to, and to use it. But we've seen so many examples time and time again that people rise to the occasion when they're given the ability and you put the trust in them to answer the questions that they find meaningful in their lives. Uh, a great example of this is there's a researcher at the University of Utah who works on educational technology. And so he's looking at how to get kids invested in science and understanding data, middle school kids. So he gave them all Fitbits and said, like, what are the questions you have? And they said, you know what? How many steps does it take to go? Is it the difference between steps and going up a hill or going down a hill? It's a very, it's like, it's a nonsense question. It doesn't really matter. But by having them go through this process of collecting data, answering a question that they cared about, they're able to do things that are usually not taught until you get, in, get into college. You know, they're able to understand that what is an outlier and how does it affect analysis. You know, people have curiosities. They understand that they can answer questions. I think what we should work together towards is empowering them with not only the tools but the opportunities 
to bring the rich contextual information that they have, like they are literally the boots on the ground, to bear when we are trying to understand the impact of climate change on you know, their individual lives, like I said before, their neighborhoods, their communities, and our nation. How, how, do, you, how do you manage the component of everyone, how do you think about managing the component of access of data and science? Where, where this, this idea of, okay, what, what separates the playing from the, the peer-reviewed kind of real stuff? Yeah, so um, I take to heart something that was told to me after one of our conferences by um, a woman named Ann Wright, who I really respect. She's a great member of our community. And she said there's a very big difference between big S science and little s science. Big S science is what you read in JAMA. Little s science is what we all learned in middle school, and we put it on poster boards. It's having a hypothesis, doing observations, answering a question. I think we have the ability to empower people to do science, a fundamental, just like asking those questions, doing observations. Like the, the, the fundamental thing in science and data is observation. It always starts with observations. And if we can help people make observations that matter, then I think we're going to be able to do some pretty fantastic things. Awesome. Allie. Yeah. Thank you, DJ. Um, so I wake up every morning and go to Google, and everybody there is tackling massive scale problems. That's what we do. And health and climate change is a very large scale, massive problem that's going to demand a large scale solution. And I think that it's the combination of resources that we have uh, from, from the government, the, through the open data policy, we have vast public data. And if you then use the massive cloud computing from some of the private sector companies and put it into the hands of the world's leading scientists, they'll be able to unlock the value of this data for public good. And derive knowledge from it that's, more, that's timely and more detailed and really relevant to these issues. Um, and so that's, that's what really drives me every day was we're building out Google Earth Engine and making sure that it does what these scientists need, to, need it to do in order to ask these questions they might not otherwise be able to ask. And, and you know, at Google, you have some of the top computing talent, you've got data scientists, you've got scientists, you, I mean, you, you, you bubble tea, you've know, <laughs> you got, you got it all. What is it, what, like, what is, tell us what the, it's, it's, what's in the thought process of all this type of talent that you have when they see the, the things that you've been working, like the project you just showed us, like that, that Randy's done on, on the forest fire, or uh, fires around the world. What is it that people take away and how are they thinking about, man, how, how to think about that problem? Yeah, so I think, that, and that's a great question, um, we at, at Google are always trying to get this information into the hands of citizens. So we have all of these resources at our disposal, some of the, the top um, talent, and they're all working on these big issues, all with the, the meaning to do public good. And um, if we are able to help the scientists distill that information into actionable um, applications that citizens on the ground can use, um, then we can help enable some bottom-up um, activities and decisions that might affect change. And so we're, we're just always thinking of the, of the end user, the, the people who can use this information to make decisions. Great, thank you. Uh, Ethan, tell us about like, how you're thinking about it. I know you're doing some of this amazing research on, on these different things. You've got the entire playground of Microsoft <laughs> at your fingertips. It's a nice playground. <laughs> um, yeah, so from the engineering point of view, what I find incredibly exciting is that um, we're at this moment where really important technology trends are, are converging. And I think they give an opportunity to change the way we do big science and little science. Um, uh, I tried to ramble about those convergences earlier, but, um, but to be clear about them, I think first, um, 
autonomous systems are really coming to light. So in before, you know, previously we thought about robotics, we thought about drones as something that uh, you would never have, a, you, know, you know, would never be under the, um, but you would never get it for a birthday, right? It's something that, uh, uh, that costs billions of dollars or you only see it in science fiction movies. But today these things are, are here. Um, they offer an amazing platform to go into the environment and do things at scale that we couldn't do before. So I think that's one incredibly interesting trend. Um, the second trend, which has been talked about a lot, is the trend of, of big data um, and commoditization of computation. So that if you have a lot of data you have to crunch, you don't have to build a data center. Um, I visited our data center. I, data center tools, tours are very cool. You really see what goes into a data center when you visit one and why you don't want to have to build one yourself. <laughs> so, so that's a really exciting trend. And then the third trend I want to put in there for, for health is, um, uh, is genomics and gene sequencing because what this trend is doing is very much mirroring what, uh, uh, what microprocessors did. At first it was $10 billion to sequence the human genome. Um, and now we're looking at the cost of sequencing what's floating around in the mosquito at around $40 a piece. Um, and then computationally figuring out what's inside of it. So when you put those things together, it's just such an exciting time to, to reimagine how you can do both, uh, both big science and, and little science. And I hope if the quality of the systems are high enough, and, and that's what's very important to me, for high quality systems that do what they're supposed to do. If the systems are of high quality, then, you, um, then the data you get will be of, will be of high quality. And you, and you can use it to, um, uh, to answer deep scientific questions, or maybe a user can use it to ask, you know, What's that funny cold floating around uh, outside of my office? Everybody seems to be sick. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, yeah, so, so that, that's my takeaway message. We're at, we're at a time of convergence, and I think there's going to be a lot of really cool uh, technology that can give us deep insight into how the world is evolving, uh, actionable in, insight. And could you just tell us briefly a little bit more about where you see the sensor type of technology coming together in the framework that it's you know, traditionally something that we've just stuck in the ground and left there versus the notion of having a semi-autonomous or autonomous right. type, yeah. type uh, sensor network. Right, so, so the, the, the prototype system we've been thinking about focuses on mosquitoes first because um, they're one of the most uh, important disease vectors. Um, so we looked at what does it take to ask, you know, what's in the mosquitoes floating around here? And it takes a lot of work. You take a trap, you hike out to wherever you want to put it. You usually drag along some dry ice because the bait is CO2. You leave it there for a day, you come back a day later, you collect it, and then you take it to a laboratory where you do processing. Um, so what we've tried to, to think about is what if you could reinvent that whole stack? So first, the trap that you deploy isn't something you have to carry. It doesn't come with a lot of dry ice. It isn't heavy and expensive, but it's lightweight, cheap, and smart. It can detect, this is the thing I want to catch, let everything else through. If it's lightweight and smart, you can put it on, on a drone, a UAV, and it can go fly on top of a building, land in a forest, where otherwise it takes you, you know, takes you two hours just to get there. Um, and I'm saying that from experience because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, two weeks ago we were uh, doing a feasibility study in the, in the Caribbean, which has experienced, uh, you know, chikungunya, for instance, um, a, mis a mosquito-borne uh, virus, which wasn't there two years ago. Um, so we went there and we executed the standard protocols for, model, uh, for, for collecting mosquitoes, and it took us 18 hours a day to do it. Um, and we would normally make about five to six collections per day. So that's the throughput when you go to an island that's only 100 square miles. Um, that's why it's so hard to get this data. Um, and why I think, I, I think these, these convergence of technologies can really change our understanding of, of, of uh, the state of the environment. Great, thank you. Esti, as, as chief medical officer, what, yeah, when you wake up, <laughs> how do you, like, give us, a, give us that, that medical practitioner, what, what's the biggest things for you? Well, for me, you know, I agree with the ultimate outcome is, is action that makes a difference, but I wake up thinking about how do we get there? How do we inspire the action? And so every morning I wake up feeling passionate about the ability of maps to tell a compelling story and the analysis behind maps. Because I, I'm not sure if anybody can help it. When you see a map, you go and you look at what's going on where you live or where you work or where your family lives. You're immediately engaged. 
And so how then can you take that engagement and turn it into something that will move people forward in this uh, climate change and health initiative? So that's where I'm stuck is at, at the passion part. How do we engage the community with this wonderful vehicle to give them a more comprehensive view of the data that, that they may own or that they have access to now with the open data portals available? So that's what I think about. And, and how do you tell us a little bit more about what you found, especially at Esri, and how do you take this kind of complicated data, turn it into maps, and really help transform that narrative? Well, um, we have a lot of professionals who, who do that. I will say that uh, I got a degree in GIS, and now the company's made it so darn easy to use that my degree's, uh, you know, useless. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I think that the how is actually the easy part, you know, and, and I think people have alluded to that. The technology is not the problem. The knowledge is not even the problem now. It's the action. And so, so what we've tried to do is be action focused and just make the technology platform based so that you can pull any data set that you're interested in, especially if it's open, but your own authoritative spreadsheet data or CSVs or DBFs, and you, you really almost literally throw it into the platform. You've got visualization and then we make our tools smart and easy to use. So, so that's how we do it at Esri. We just try to make it intuitive. Yeah, Linda, you wanted to jump in. Well, I, I, I think you're, you're really asking exactly the right question, which is how do we use data to motivate, activate, inspire action? And I believe that one of the things that we haven't done such a good job on is linking the data that shows what the problems are with the information about what the solutions are. And since we do have many, many solutions that will help us address both health and climate, how do we move people from seeing that there's a problem on the map in their neighborhood or you know the, the fires lighting up on the Google Earth tool um, to showing people that there are real solutions that they can be a part of the solution themselves in their own action but that they also need to engage with policymakers and decision makers at every level of government and in their communities to make those systems changes that are really going to drive healthier, mm -hmm. um, healthier lives for all of us and address climate change. So there's a number of directions we could go with this with some of the questions. I think one of the ones that, that we'll, we'll pick, because there's, there's two ones that I really want to ask here is that, that go off of this. The first is, you know, this, the adage that I was taught by my dad and my, my advisors was, you know, bleeding edge is great for science. Bleeding edge is really a rough place if you're trying to build a product or give us something that's, that's sustainable. You want to be cutting edge, but not bleeding edge. <laughs> and how do we take all this work and move it from, from those domains into the community programs, the individual actions, the things that you're, 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 you, just, you just mentioned, Linda? And so let me just throw it out there for, for whoever wants to take some of these. I can start. Uh, I mean, I think what you have to do is talk to people on the ground and figure out what is uh, their, their business need, what is the value, and focus on those problems. We invent a lot of things because it's fun and cool to invent it, but you can't, I mean, that's what technology sometimes does, but it's better to invent with an end in mind, an intention of how we're gonna use this to accomplish whatever goals we have. So, so I would say that the first step is really talking to um, stakeholders in any community or area that, that you want to affect change and understanding what their business needs are and then working on solutions toward that. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in with Please, an example? jump right in. Yeah, great. Um, so to, to follow up on that, uh, talking about asking people um, is, is the way to go. You, wanna, you don't want to build things and just assume people are going to come. But at the same time, um, you're not, people don't always know what's right around them if it's not visible. And that's um, an example of why we're putting uh, methane sensors or why we're working with the Environmental Defense Fund to put the methane sensors onto the street view cars, use the street view cars as a platform in order to uh, look at where there are leaks in some of the pipelines in, in major cities. And as citizens who live in those cities um, see these leaks, they can work with the government and talk to regulators and uh, start to improve those pipelines in their area. Okay. 
Well, let me keep pushing on this because this, this I, I, I think, and Ernesto, I'm going to uh, hand this over to you also, is because <laughs> this kind of, I think touches on the quantified self movement also, which is great. I've got all this data. I can make a, amazing, beautiful things of it. Some of the stuff which we've called, you know, like, it's just, you know, looks like amazing art pieces. How do we get the public and the individual to really start turning that data into action oriented? knowledge, wisdom, and, and let me start with saying also, you know, when we see these amazing maps, the classic thing that I've noticed is if we're measuring this from a consumer internet perspective, one of these things, we say, whoa, okay, it got a lot of views, but it didn't get a lot of real in-depth usage. So it's kind of very surface deep for a tremendous amount of opportunity in tech. So how do we get the, the, the public to really listen and accept the science and really start moving forward on these type of uh, initiatives? So I think one of the ways that we can get the public involved is by giving them more opportunities to be an involved player in the game. I think many times we're, we're you know, card-carrying member of the research community here. Um, we say, like, I have an important question. Come to me. Give me your data so I can answer my question. And then maybe in a year ago or so, you can read my article or something. Um, which is great, you know, that's the way like, science is, is that way for a very particular reason. Um, but I think we are starting to see some more opportunities for people to engage very, very quickly and um, bring their data to bear on important questions. I think a great example of this is what uh, was released a couple, well, what was it now, almost four weeks ago? Research kit, you know, with Apple saw the release of five applications where people with iPhones could say, like, I'm willing to give my data and see information about myself to a group of researchers so that they, we can answer together questions that are important to me and our broader community. And it just kind of went gangbusters. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. And John Wilbanks is back there in the room. So please tell me if I'm wrong. Are we now, like, over 50,000 enrolled? 60,000 enrolled people in these five different studies. I think the thing that kind of really hit at home for me is, you know, there's a Parkinson study as part of those core first research kit apps. And I think I was reading stuff from John, and he was saying, you know, the largest Parkinson study to date had about 1,200, was it, enrollees? And they, they got to nine, 10,000 within the first week. People saying, you know what, this is important. I have data. I want to know something about myself, but I also want to contribute to the public good by engaging in the research process. I think what we're also going to see, and we actually have seen this um, through PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, is that when people can bring their own questions as well, and I've, I'm sorry if I keep harping on this, but it's just it's kind of the message that I want to bring is that, you know, there are some really interesting things that they're willing to do. People are willing to go a long way to answer the questions that are important to them. And I think just giving them those opportunities, whether it's really technical means or even like very, very simple things. Like, you know, water samples aren't that hard to collect. People can do them pretty quickly. You know, air samples and the sensing technology, people can make this stuff in their garages or they can, you know, go down to a local public health institute or public health department and enroll in these type of things if we give them those opportunities. Ethan, how about you? Yeah, I'm trying, I've been pondering this question. Um, so, you know, Microsoft Research has a, a very long history in, uh, in many different research disciplines. And um, I think the, the answer of, of how you get from cutting edge research to the hands of the consumer is a, is a complicated one. It takes um, uh, making sure the research is sound and well developed, and then it takes finding the right markets and finding the right groups that help push that to market. And, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, uh, the, that's sort of our model. It, 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 happens, um, it, it happens intentionally. There's not a single recipe for it, um, how you get, you know, an arbitrary idea to the most impact. It has, it, it, it in a sense grows organically, but, but, with, but, but uh, with direction. Um, a few examples, you know, I, I, I can mention are, are the band. Uh, so the band was developed um, with a lot of uh, uh, collaboration from researchers in MSR. The use of Connect for um, monitoring Parkinson's disease what came from, from MSR. E even fundamental um, uh, uh, components from Connect were in collaboration with MSR. Um, each one of those has a different route that it took to get to where it is today. Um, but I, I guess my, my meta-level message is, as, as a large research organization, 
um, it's something that we always think about. It, 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 it definitely guides the projects that we take on, and we try to make sure we're in tune to the um, uh, to the trajectories that it can evolve in, so that the, the research can make impact and get into the hands of people. All right, so we got five minutes left, so we're going to start jamming through this. So <laughs> please, Linda, jump in. Yeah, you know, we've learned a lot about how people change their behavior in public health as we took on the tobacco industry to reduce smoking, which has been very successful, or as we tried to get people to use seat belts. And I think what we've learned is that giving people information is an important first step, but that we also need to change social norms, we need to change people's environments to make it easy for them to do the right thing. So it's, it's great to give people information, but we have to also support policy change, changes in our transportation system, uh, changes in our energy system, so that people that are living their lives in communities have choices to make that are easy and that are right for their health and right for the climate. All right, so let's get nerdy and geeky for a minute. Let, let's, uh, let's get to the specifics of round, some of the stuff around, well, we're talking about open data. How do we think about open source, uh, the open standards, the, the complexity that, that sits there with the metadata, the data quality, you know, sort of the, it's very easy to say, hey, open data, yay. The nitty gritty of using it. How do you, how should we be thinking about it? What do you wish, like, Boy, like guys, we got to get this this fixed, or uh, I'm thrilled with this. More of like my, more of things like this. Yes. Well, my biggest wish for open data is that everybody would please use national standards um, for describing their data, for data exchange, for all of the different things for which we have national standards but they need to be widely adopted. And then that's gonna make data integration so much easier. You know, any technology then can handle it and consume that data in meaningful ways. And what, is, what are those national standards? Like, to, to, like for, for people that are out there trying to do this, what, what, how do they find them, where would you look? Well, I, I actually was doing that this morning. I was searching out uh, the different kinds of national standards that are available. You know, in data exchange, we have HL7, for example. Um, we have standard uh, coding for diseases with ICD-10, um, <laughs> with a grain of salt. And then, um, and then there are laboratory uh, standards with LOINC. And then we've got SNOMED for medical terminology. There are also data standards of multiple sorts. So, so I think you have to look at you know, what is your type of data and find a national standard. Don't just release data using you know, what you think is a proper descriptor um, and, and throw it up there. Because that sharing is quite a bit less valuable than what open data was meant to be. Ali, how do you guys think about it at Google? Yeah, so to, as a follow on, as, assuming we get to a place of, of standards, um, Google Earth Engine is solving some of the infrastructure challenges of managing this big, big data that includes how you store it. You, sometimes it's too big to store on a single machine or analyze on a single machine. So um, we're just trying to help um, set it up so that the scientists can spend the most, uh, the majority of their time actually doing the science instead of trying to wrestle with the data and get it into a workable, manageable um, format to do analysis on. Uh, Ethan. Right. Um, so I, I think uh, open data, open source is, is, uh, is important. and. Um, it allows communities to build around the data. Um, I think some of the tricky questions, and I don't necessarily have answers for them, is that when you have, uh, uh, when you have data with personally identifiable information, then privacy comes in. In Microsoft, I think privacy, privacy is something that we build into our systems from the very beginning. Um, uh, and as we think about uh, health and user data, that's something that has to be in the mix. Um, um, whether that means better technologies to anonymize the data. Uh, we have some technologies being developed in the cloud where encrypted data can be stored uh, and you can operate on that, a user can operate on this data without ever decrypting it. So, so, so there are some technologies coming down the pipe that I think, um, I think will help. But in general, I, th I think it's, it, it is good to be open. Um, 
but uh, but the privacy has to be respected. Yeah, thank you for bringing in that angle of how do we responsibly use it. Uh, Linda, how, how about from, you know, you've worked at this at across governments, how do you think about fr from, from that side of things? On the use of big data? Uh, no, no, not just the use of data, uh, meaning specifically the, the open standards and what, what recommendations do you have for people out there? Well, some of the other speakers have alluded to this. I think it's really, really important that we talk to real people in real communities about what their needs are and we also figure out how to take the knowledge that they have about what's going on in their communities and link it to our other sources of data. And most importantly, I think that um, all of us that work on the technical and scientific end of things need to do a better job of translating the data and the analysis results into language that uh, people can understand so that the, the true meaning of the work that we're doing becomes apparent and the solutions uh, become more well known. And, and Ernesto, give us your 30 second view of this, especially across these different platforms that you're working on. Uh, easy, uh, data access is super, super important. People create data, whether it's stepping on a scale, slapping on a Fitbit, driving their car, they're creating data, they deserve access to it. It should be set up as a fundamental right, maybe a bill of rights for data access is somewhere that we're looking for um, people to make strides in. Great. Uh, Linda, Ethan, Ali, uh, Nurse, uh, Ernesto, Esti, I just want to thank you guys for coming out here, sharing some of your wisdom. Uh, the audience, thank you for your questions. Apologies that we didn't get all, to all of them. I hope people at this event and also uh, that are attending online, let's make this the beginning of the conversation. Let's just not let this just end here. I think this is a fantastic starting of, the, uh, of where we can go and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation throughout the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.